Hello, and a very warm welcome to our conversation live stream. I'm Dominic King, and you join me here in the UK. And this week, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome my guest. And we go to the United States to meet Ron Simons. Ron is live from Broadway for us. He is a four-time Tony Award-winning actor and producer. His production work on Broadway we will talk about and talk about those Tonys. We're going to have a chat with him tonight, but it's an absolute joy to welcome him onto the program. It's something that I've been wanting to do for a while, and we've been talking about it for absolutely ages. So welcome, Ron, to the show. Hello. Greetings and splendiferous salutations. How are you? <laughs> I knew there'd be a great intro. Uh, <laughs> really good to, to join you. So tell us where you are in New York. I am, excuse me, I'm in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood, which is about an eight to 10 minute walk from the center of Broadway. Now, we've been hearing over here, Ron, that uh, Broadway in the last week started going back to selling tickets, started to get back into the kind of swing of thinking, right, we can put these performances on. It's been a crazy old year and a half. And both when the lights went down in the West End and Broadway, it was such a strange feeling for actors, the performers, the technicians, the teams, the producers, the directors. Life, in many respects, stopped. What's when, that been like in, for you? You know, Michelle Obama said it best. Um, I looked up one day and I was in a mild depression because two things. One, of course, I love theater because I'm a storyteller. Um, and that's what my life is dedicated to, but I didn't realize how much I needed theater and live performance. Uh, it really, I started having withdrawal, withdrawal symptoms and didn't even realize it, you know, because there was a time when I was in New York and uh, my partner who was standing on the corner of Ninth Avenue and 54th and Ninth Avenue goes down and it, it's on the edge of the theater district and going up was towards Central Park. And he took a picture on up, facing uptown, downtown, there was not a soul, not a car, not a bike. Not, I mean, it was like a ghost town in the middle of the day, sun shining. It was kind of creepy, actually, right? Because no one moves to New York to sit in their apartment. You know? Right. They moved to New York because of the museums and, and the financial district and, and theater and great restaurants and, 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 and all the cultural things that make New York, New York. So it was a, it was very challenging. And I dare say it was rather traumatic, especially for people who were in the business of Broadway and entertainment. It was very, very hard to, to, to continue through that, knowing that there was nothing, no time frame involved. The moment there was a time frame where we thought, oh, okay, we have a vaccine and it looks like we might be able to do this in whatever the day was at the time, that changed my entire perspective overnight. Well, what about uh, what about as a producer and you know running a production company and working with talent and and getting them geared up to their next gig and having conversations? What was that like for you? Did you feel a responsibility that that even though it wasn't your fault that you were effectively having to say, "I'm sorry, the gig's not happening. I'm sorry, I can't connect you with that next person." Well, here what happened is uh, with my production of Ain't Too Proud, we actually did pay actors while they're furloughed for a few weeks to get them over um, because of course we felt bad because everyone was at home. No one was doing anything and it was a small token, but it was something. For me, it, it was lucky because two of the three shows that I have been working on um, had not even gone into rehearsal yet. They had not even been cast yet. Yeah. So during this time down, we've been able to uh, ramp up the, the, the casting, you know, talk to, meet with um, different actors. We were able to develop the key art that we will be using for the posters for both shows. Um, so we were we had work to do, and we were what, spending money doing it. Yeah, we, which is inevitable that you've got to carry on doing it. That's the thing, you know, you, 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 everything might stop, but you've got to carry on getting that production value up, that sense of this show is coming, don't worry, it's on the way. And you, you mentioned yeah. about Ain't Too Proud, and this is uh, The Life and Times of the Temptations, uh, an incredible sort of mix, isn't it? A story that um, I know for, for you personally, it's, it's a, a tale that you want to tell, you want to get that right as well. And performances, I understand, are going to resume on Broadway in October? 
Some are opening as early as September 15th. Oh, wow. Okay. That's, that's, that's pretty amazing to, to know that that's on the way. And I should say, I mean, those are the bigger musicals that, you know, that are coming back. So I think people like our productions, the non-musical productions that I'm working on uh, are not looking until later in the fall. And the other one is actually going to be in 2022. So uh, we get to learn a little bit about what people are doing and feeling and are they ready to come out to theater because of these shows that are coming back that are musicals. And to be yeah. honest, I think musicals stand a little bit um, a better chance because we have been in such a dire, dark place. I think people were really ready to go out and, and sing along and tap their toes and you know hear music and be inspired and all of those things, right? So I, I personally feel that it's going to be a nice rebound. It's not going to be as as, as, as as small as we hope. It may not be as big as we hope, uh, but I think it's going to be a nice return because as a friend of mine said, Ron, what happened after the Spanish flu? Uh, and, and I said, well, what? She said, the roaring 20s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People yeah. have been stuck in that de depressed, scared, whatever place with no answers, no qu nothing. Then they were like, when they were allowed to, they just burst at the seams and the, and, and the 20s came. So. Yeah, the, the 2020s is definitely something on both sides of the Atlantic is being talked about as this kind of, in some respects, a renaissance. But I think you're right about the idea of, you know, some of these musical theatre productions that can just get people also energized again and wanting to be in a theater and having that uplift it, it's so important and we know that music i mean if you're going to do it do it the temptations the music is going to be something that brings us out and i think it has been something that has definitely connected people music over the period of uh, the year and a half you know people have been re-going into their playlists i wonder if you've done the same where you just sort of go God, i haven't heard that for ages and you've had a bit more time and i know mm -hmm. time is not something you normally uh, have a great relationship with <laughs> because you haven't been able to do it have you time has yep. been sort of like right what's the next job where am i going next what am i doing so has that given you a sense in your life of just going ah it has. Um, but or do I need to ask your family, Ron? <laughs> That's a good point. My partner might have a completely different take on this, but <laughs> I feel as though on the one hand, I was biting at the bit to get back to work. But then on the other hand, I was able to read a book. Do you know the last time I actually read a book that was not a script or a screenplay? <laughs> ages, literally ages. And it was so comforting to sit down with a real book in my hand and open it and read it. And it gave me time. I started doing more meditation. I started doing um, more literally, it wasn't meditation, but I would sit in my living room with some nice relaxing music and I would just float. That would never happen. Who had time for that when you were actually producing shows actively? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So, so it it did give me an opportunity to reconnect with my partner. It gave me great opportunity to spend time on and with myself, and that was great. I, I can't even imagine actually what the in normal times what the pressure is like when you're running shows and uh, you've got somehow to keep that all going. Everyone sort of you know it's like it, it's juggling, isn't it? It's juggling balls. It's kind of like going right. Where are we going next? What are we doing next? Um, but at the same time, having to have a sense of um, I guess people are looking to you to make sure that you know what you're doing because if mm -hmm. you don't, they're they're going. What, lead us, Ron. Tell us what. What's going on? Right, right, right. And I, I got to tell you, people were always, everywhere I turned, people were, and I mean everywhere, anyone who even knew that I was a Broadway producer were always buying into the bit every time I talked to them. So when do you think it's coming back? So, um, you know, <laughs> what, what, what's happening now? You know, is everything dead? I mean, I mean, like, and so I felt this need to sort of like, um, to give them some level of comfort, even though I didn't mm. know the answers to almost any of those questions. But I will say that this one thing did really make a difference, I think, and that is for my play, Thoughts of a Colored Man, that's going to be opening in the fall. Um, we put up our marquee on the theater, and that got so many newspapers and outlets and radio stations and television stations saying, oh, look, Broadway is coming back here on the Golden Theater. So it got so much attention because it became the beacon of hope that Broadway was going to return. And when you th think about a show like that, you know, Thoughts of a Coloured Man, I know is something that 
um, it, as a play, you know, it really sort of brings together a, a lot of things, spoken word, slam poetry. It's this mosaic of life, but it's the inner lives of black men. And it's a, uh, uh, well, I want you to take the story for us about it's effectively over the course of a single day in Brooklyn. Tell us more. Yeah, it follows these seven men um, who have allegor allegorical names like uh, wisdom, love, uh, lust, anger. And it follows them over a 24-hour period, as you mentioned, in a gentrified neighborhood in Brooklyn. And as you may or may not know, African-American men, uh, I'm not sure if this is true of um, British African men, that we are accused of not sharing our inner lives. We don't talk about how we feel. We're not, you know, we, we may be feeling emotions, but we don't share them. Well, this play is the complete antithesis of that. This is all about what African-American men of the 21st century are thinking about, worried about, fearful of, in their trials, their tribulations, their celebrations. You know, it's, it is a, it, it's a relatively deep dive into who we as African-American men are. <laughs> and that's historical because that's not happened before. And so I'm really proud to be one of the people who are bringing this story to bear because it's a story that needs to be told right now, especially in the wake of, of George Floyd's murder, right? George Floyd's voice has been silenced. We will never hear from him again. But on stage, I feel as though we have seven George Floyds who are telling their stories and it's moving and it's is <laughs> hilarious and it's inspiring and it's it's all the thing the great theater is supposed to be. So I'm just really excited to share it with the world because um, I think it's going to make a big impact. And and before it, it, it uh, before Broadway actually, you know, the, like all work, you test, don't you? And you 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 have opportunities. And am I right that it was at the Baltimore Center Stage that that you did some test work and uh, Syracuse Stage as well to do to just to to see how that works? Is that the is that right? Yeah, that's right. We had the, the world premiere was at Syracuse, and then we had a co-production uh, with Baltimore Center Stage, which is where right. the piece went next. And we learned a lot about the piece, and we learned a lot about audience response to the piece. Because honestly, I was a little worried that 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 African Americans would be drawn to it and would get it, and that perhaps you know white audiences may feel like they were outside of the loop and not quite. And I got to tell you, white folks in Syracuse lost their minds. I mean, they were just so into it, thought it was so funny and, and engaging. Literally, people came up to us and said, how much money do you need to get this to Broadway? Mm. That, never happens. that doesn't happen. So the fact that they said, hey, what can we do to help? said that to me that not only did they get it, but they were willing to put, you know, their money on the line to show that they wanted this play to happen. So it was really a great experience for us. I think it's a really interesting thing, actually, isn't it, about how, uh, particularly with theatre, um, I know for you and part of the, the talks and the, the meetings and the people you have is about looking at diversity and its place in Broadway and where it is and where we are now. And I think, you know, you and I have had conversations about, we have the past, we have the future, but what about the now? What about the now? Is it, is it something that we always have to do, that we are always saying, oh, that happened there, this happened in the future, that we're hoping it's going to be like this, but what about now? And that, I think, sometimes is so lost in the conversation about everything in life, but particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, race, diversity, uh, community, humanity. It's that missing bit. It's now. That's right. That's right. And so, you know, when we look at or I look at organizations, company, whoever, who are talking about what they are going to do with uh, initiatives helping to, for EDI, equity, diversity and inclusion, you know, I, I go, OK, to your point. Oh, OK, so this is something that you're going to make happen sometime in the future where I want to say, are you bringing on diverse members of the community in mentorship programs? Are you doing so with internship programs? You know this, and they talk about the pipeline of getting people prepared from diverse backgrounds, ready to come out and do the work, say on Broadway, but that's, that doesn't happen overnight. You know, if you want people to, to learn this skill and be perfected, you gotta start bringing them in years before. And I get that, I get that. From my point of view, however, the question is always gonna be, 
you know, what have you accomplished since you said you were going to do that? So you said you were going to do that last year. Now, what is what has happened since then? What's going on right now? Do you have 10 interns you know, lined up that are working in the industry? Do you have you started a program to educate you know, your people about diversity and, and what that means and how important that is? So I'm, I, I, I feel somewhat optimistic because there have been uh, a lot of changes going on, particularly like with Broadway theater owners who are heard that call about diversity. And that's the reason why two of my shows um, both of them are about people of color, got births on Broadway, because that is really hard. I mean, there's so few Broadway theaters. There are way more productions than there are Broadway theaters. Mm. So they are focusing now on telling the story, stories of diverse communities, and particularly people of color. So I hope this is not just a flash in the pan. I'm hoping that this will continue through further seasons when, when maybe the talk isn't as focused on diversity. Do you know what I, I mean? Think- I think it's interesting as well about the idea of, you know, I get to cover the West End in my uh, radio job over here in the UK. And, you know, we often think of that stretch as this, you know, huge, it's the West End. And I know the same happens. Where it's Broadway. Um, and I'm going to just let everyone into a secret. I'm a bit ashamed of, to be honest with you. My first ever time, well, actually, it was my second time in New York when I was supposedly an adult. Um, I uh, got into the cab at... Uh, uh, JFK, and I said, um, "Can you take me to Broadway, please?" And the uh, the cab driver said, uh, "Sure." Yeah. <laughs> so then uh, I then got in the car, and he said, "Do you want to go anywhere in particular?" And I said, "Oh, we're staying at a hotel called the Broadway American." And he went, "And whereabouts on Broadway is it?" And I went, "Well, it's Broadway. It's a small stretch, isn't it, where the theaters are." Bear in mind, I'm like, uh, I'm probably like 18 or something. Oh. And he, he said, I oh, know. And he said, uh, he said, okay, I'm going to drop you off in Broadway. Ron, he dropped me off in Broadway. We looked around for this hotel, the Broadway American. I don't know if it's still there. We, uh, we, then, we then looked up and down the, as you would call it, the block, realized on the map that Broadway is a 30 mile stretch, I think. Is that right? It's a long, <laughs> it's a long, long, it's a long stretch. Is that right? It's not that big, but yes, it is a long stretch. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the point is, it, Broadway and the West End of London is a is a is a sense. It's a community right. idea. It's yeah. a theater land. It's not uh, somewhere you can define as this is it. You know, there, there might be, and then I'm going to your point about there are only so many theatres. And I think sometimes people think there's so much. Why is that not going into the West End? Why is that not on Broadway? Well, you try finding a space. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right, and, and, right. Yeah. And I guess sometimes, that's what you do. I guess that's what you do all the time. Absolutely. And it's sometimes it's, it's a bit of a wait for you to get, because guess what? There are a number of gatekeepers um, for a show to get to Broadway. Number one, you've got to have a producer who believes in the piece, who's going to help develop the piece, who's going to help do workshops. If it's a new piece, go out of town, you know, bring it back. And all that stuff needs to be created, managed, and overseen, and that's the producer. So if you don't have a producer, that's just going to make your job so much more difficult. But once you have a producer and the producer's like, all right, we're doing this. You do all that work. You get all the kinks out. And now you're ready. You've got this beautiful piece of work. And you're like, okay, let's go to Broadway. And I've had people tell me, and with a show um, that I thought was just extraordinary. And they, one of them said, two of them said to me, yeah, this really isn't our kind of show. Mm. And I was like, what do you mean? This is, this is a show. It has everything. It's hilariously funny. It is tragic. It is inspiring. It's short. It's only two-hander. It's only two people in the show, so it's cheap. How is this not? And so that's the second gatekeeper, because you may believe in that story like nobody else. But if that kind of doesn't get translated to theater owners, then you may never see Broadway with that piece. Getting shows to Broadway, it's a, a huge conversation. The same happens with the West End, trying to work out, you know, what's going where. And then, like today, I was interviewing the cast of uh, The Mousetrap over here in the UK, which just happens to have been on for 70 years. 70? 70 years. 
I mean, it's it's a crazy idea, isn't it? You know, the idea that one show can last for so long. So from the pen of Agatha Christie to the West End of London. And it <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, can you imagine someone saying, could we just get in the theatre? Oh, no, no, no. Mousetrap's going to do another couple of years. Right. <laughs> uh, but that, but they, they've done an interesting thing, Ron. They've done, um, they've got two casts going into, they, so they start on Monday with uh, the Mousetrap. They've got two separate casts full of leading UK actors. And the idea is that they will have understudies covering all of the, the roles, but they have two separate casts so they can cope with COVID. So one cast will do a few weeks, the cast will go out, the next cast will go in, and they're doing it that way. So they've got two of the key, I mean, all the main characters, obviously, because they're doubling up. And they have done it as a response to COVID. But also what it's done is that if you've got your favorite particular character that you've seen in The Mousetrap for years, you want to see someone else do it. You've got two chances because there's two different actors who are going to do it over a period of between now and, you know, uh, October or something. So, I mean, that's quite interesting as an idea. I don't know if that would ever even be considered in the States there. Well, of course, we have understudies. So, you know, we're going to. Sometimes it means a, a double cast in that regard because there's so many, yeah, uh, so many roles to. Usually it's not that. However, it's a it's a number less. Um, but this is I, two main casts. I mean, it's I, great. You know, I don't even yeah. See, I, this is the thing. What I love about the UK, you can do a show for a third of what it costs to do that show on Broadway. Right. So that is a huge, huge thing. And I've, I've, I've. I go to London periodically to see what's going on, but I really would love to collaborate with, um, you know, British uh, producers to do that as a possible um, early run, as opposed to saying doing a regional theater here. Um, Cause I feel that, that Londoners are so discriminating when it comes to theater. They don't really put up with a lot of bullshit. <laughs> you know, I just feel like they are discerning and you know when they love what they love, they love it, and it may run. I don't know, seventy years, which is mind blowing. I mean, it's mind blowing, isn't it? I mean, it, 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 and 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 it is just because obviously you know the Agatha Christie story. It's an evergreen, and it just works. And people yeah. want to, they just want to keep seeing it. But in the same way, you know, look at something like Les Mis. You know, again, people want to see it. They want to see cats. They want to see those those familiar. But what it does. As much as we love Lord Andrew Lloyd Webber, what it does sometimes, and Cameron McIntosh, it does sometimes prevent maybe certain other bits of work going into places because there aren't the spaces, as you said at the beginning. So it's about how do you do that? How do you achieve it? Uh, for those who are just joining us, thank you so much for joining our live stream on Facebook, Twitter, and also on my YouTube channel at Laughing Frog Productions. So here we are. We are here on our Thursday evening together, and this is who I'm talking to. Uh, Ron Simons is wow. with us. Uh, there's your there's your, your gallery of pictures. Um, we've got a few up there just to kind of give a... I mean, first of all, we can obviously see the the, the awards going on, which we'll talk about in a moment. And uh, when we come back to you, we can see yeah, that they are behind you, uh, where you are there in Hell's Kitchen in New York. But I just wanted to p p point out one particular picture of uh, Oprah Winfrey um, uh, above the top there for people to see. Um, I guess I, I don't know what the relationship is there. I don't know what that event is, but you get to meet a lot of people. You work with a lot of people, a lot of people, you're friends within the industry. Just take us through maybe some of these pictures uh, and, and some of the work you do with universities as well, which you can see on the right, but at the top there with Oprah. Well, Oprah and I were happy, not together. I want to say that because we're not friends. Um, I love her like most of the universe does. But she and I were at the uh, an award ceremony. I believe it was the, I'm going to have to remember what it is. But we were at this ceremony. And, and when, when she came in, I was in the lobby. And all I saw were like 50 people moving like ants as a cluster through the lobby. And I was like, what's going on? Clearly somebody of, of note is in it. And it kind of goes into the theater. And then I realized as this crowd dispersed that it was Oprah Winfrey. And I was like, oh my God, I love Oprah Winfrey. I love Oprah Winfrey. I said, I am going to ask to take a picture of her. So this is, this. do not think that we are friends or acquaintances. I literally <laughs> just walked up to her and said, Miss, Miss Winfrey, I'm a huge fan. Would it be okay to take a picture? And Apparently, a number of people have been doing it before me, and she was like a little exasperated. She was like, <sighs> "Okay." <laughs> so then I turned to her bodyguard uh, and said, "Would you mind 
taking this picture. And he did, and he took the picture, and that's how that came about. Other photographs are actually, I knew the people, like the one on the, uh, the upper left-hand corner, right? That, that woman who was holding the Tony, which was for the Tony Award we won for Jitney, uh in 2017 or 18 um i those have been people who i've worked with if you look the the the, the frame right below that you see a person just to my right he was my partner in terms of the co-producing with uh mtc manhattan theater club and that was just a, a, a still of us on stage i don't and i don't know which Oh, Masha. Okay, so the one just to the right is at the Tony Award ceremony for Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike, because that's the poster mean from them. The that one was best the, play, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. You know, it's so funny because the four Tonys are for best new play, best revival of a play, best musical, and best revival of a musical. So those are the four, you know, big categories. So I've been really lucky enough to to have one of those statues for each. And then uh, the one below that is just me in my office where I'm sitting literally right now. You can see the little envelope or whatever, right? Yeah. And we can see your your Tony's behind you there on the shelf as well. Yeah, yeah that, that's right. They're twinkling, twinkling, twinkling. Yeah, that, I love it. I love it. But the, the great thing about them is you, you've you named every one of those Tonys. Is that right? I have. I, did I tell you that? I guess I did. I have known. I'm, I named them after my four <laughs> kids, right? So I, I've got in no particular order. I've uh, I've got Elise, I've got Langston, I've got Isaiah, and I have Zora. So <laughs> if I win any more statues, I'm gonna have to go over to stepchildren <laughs> or godchildren. I love it. I love it. Uh, it's so good having you with us uh, here on the live stream, and thanks for all those who are sending in uh, messages as well. We've put up a few, and we'll uh, we'll do some more of that, and we'll, we'll get you if you want to do some questions as well. I'm sure Ron would be very happy to answer whatever you're going to ask. Um, Ron, I'd like to bring in a, an extra guest, uh, if I may. Um, this is a uh, UK theatre producer, and he's a theatre critic. He's a critic, Ron. He's a critic. Oh, God! What? No, I'm not. I <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring him in. i welcome him in. Uh, John Martin. Hi, John. Hi, Tom. Hi, Ron. Hi, John. How are you? Oh, my God. You've got one of the posters of my show up there behind you. Oh, yeah. you're great, man. I love you. Thank you. you. <laughs> That's all I needed. We're good. Can you, uh, can, can you point, John? It's, well, sorry, that way. Where, where am I? I'm backwards. It's A Gentleman's <laughs> Guide to Love and Murder, which is, Ron, one of my favorite shows. I was lucky enough to see it on Broadway. Oh, um, And just, God. I have not laughed so much since... I saw, I think, um, the producers just <laughs> loved it. Loved it, loved it. I got to say, I'm right there with you. You know, I'm proud of all the stuff that I do. But from the moment that I got involved with that piece, I literally laughed hysterically, sometimes even cried. And it had good music, as you recall, right? Wonderful music. Right? So, yeah, I, I right here. We agree. Totally agree. <laughs> hold on, hold cool. on. Ron, can I, can I say that's the nicest he's ever been to a guest I've ever heard him talk about? <laughs> It's not true, Dom. It's not true. <laughs> that, that, John, He's mean know, to me, Ron. That's Is true. That uh, John, I know you've been watching the live stream since we started uh, just at uh, 10.30 in, in the UK, 5.30 in, in New York. Um, just a sense of Ron talking about theatre itself, and, and I was talking with about those kind of similarities, I guess, between the West End and Broadway. Just pick up on that for us. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the thing that I'm sort of most thrilled about is that serious drama is coming back and, and is coming back soon with Thoughts of a Coloured Man, because that, that it, that it or, although it's tried out of, out, out of town, that it is opening on Broadway, I think it's just fantastic because, yes, I love um, musicals, but theatre, as as Don was saying, theatre can respond and should deal with now. And that's what it can do. And that's what it can help. That's right. And that's one of the reasons why I love that particular piece. Well, and also my other one for, uh, for Colored Girls, because the issues spoken therein are still incredibly and unfortunately relevant today. It really gives us a sense of where we are in the right now. And even though one was written, you know, 48 years ago, and this one is making its Broadway debut. Um, for me, I tell people all the time, I want to change the world one project at a time. And so, but I want to do that 
while making money and while entertaining, right? So it's a rare thing to find a piece that fits all of those, checks all of those boxes. So I'm really fortunate when I find one like Thoughts of a Color Man, where it just covers, it's the center of my wheelhouse. It covers all the things that I look for in great theater. And I love drama too, John. So I'm really thrilled that, and not just us, but there are a number of dramas that are gonna be produced um, here in, in New York and I hear on the West End as well. Yes, I mean, you know, over here, a lot of the straight drama comes from the subsidized sector, mm -hmm. comes from the National Theatre. I mean, even Hades Town had a tryout at the National Theatre before heading to Broadway. Mm -hmm. um, but so much of the West, there was a time a good few years ago, uh, or not that many years ago, when it was estimated that about 60% of the plays and shows in the West End had originated from our national theater. Wow. Because there was there was War Horse, there was an Alan Bennett play, yeah. there was One Man, Two Governors, and oh, yeah. there was this massive splurge of shows that had all come from that one building. Amazing. Um, and yeah, I, I, but as- I, I, I'm so, I don't know, jealous is not quite the word, but it kind of is that, you know, you guys, you know, have uh, in a country that really appreciates, understands art and supports art because it's just because there is next to no money for federal dollars to do anything in terms of development of a show. It's all has to be privately funded. And that depends on the economy, which, for example, when COVID happened, I'm still raising money, but COVID happened and all these people who had money in shows that were closed were too nervous to talk about investing in new shows, right? Uh -huh. And because the government, you know, the only thing that the government did is what the government did for pretty much the rest of the country, which is say, I got unemployment. Um, you know, I applied for certain grants and loans. I got a loan, but it's never been, this is a one-off, you know? This is something that I have always, I, when I get to be another 10 years, I want to start lobbying, you know, the, 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 the Congress and the Senate to say, this must need change. Theater is so important because let's be honest, storytelling is the greatest agent for change we have on this planet and we need to be using it and it should be supported by the government. Just on that point then, John, you know, from Ron's perspective, it, it, it's a, a lot more supported over here in the UK. Where do you see the arts, particularly over COVID? Have they been supported as well as they could have been? Have they been seen as uh, a, an essential part of culture for us? Mm, at the beginning, I think the answer was no. When at, at the beginning... Uh, figures such as Andrew Lloyd Webber and had to argue very hard for um, support, for subsidy. The argument has been made um, and sort of accepted, but nothing was really done at the beginning of all the extra benefits that we bring with tourism, with restaurants, with mm. hotels, everything else, let alone the work that we do. Um, and with I don't know whether it's the same in New York, but certainly here with the high street in danger, shops closing, things moving online, um, that the the uh, the high street and retail needs to look to theatre to help to revitalise it and bring people together. So there's an economic reason as well as the artistic reason, but that did have to be fought for. And ultimately there was a large sum of money that was given out via the Arts Council to organizations, but that didn't reach freelancers. That went to theaters and institutions. It hasn't really gone to creating work. So we're going to, it's gonna be very interesting to see what comes out of this, how, as you say, Ron, how, readily are people willing to come back what will they come back and see i'm like you banking on the roaring 20s happening yeah yes but, that, but that's an interesting point isn't it about the 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 and yeah fingers crossed definitely you know it, it, the thing the thing about um the freelance side of theater i think sometimes it's often not understood that there are an awful lot of people who 
won't be part of a, a subsidy situation because they uh, they might not even be able to be furloughed because they simply find themselves in a position where they're kind of between different areas of funding and the rest. And that, I think, has been the real tricky situation. I know of professionals in the music industry who uh, they now not doing that at all. They're working, you know, and there's nothing wrong with where they're working because they're enjoying some of the jobs they're doing, but they're working in industries that they never even thought they would, you know. So it's a kind of, it's a it's a real mix. But this kind of light at the end, I don't want to say end actually, because we don't know, but this light at this current stage of the tunnel um, is maybe something that's giving us a lot of hope. And I think, Ron, that's what we're seeing. And as I mentioned with Broadway, as I mentioned earlier, John, you know, we've talked about it, but the the, the fact the mousetrap is going on uh, on Monday, being the first of the theatre productions to open on, on the West End. By the way, John, uh, when I said to Ron uh, that the mousetrap had been around for 70 years, this was his reaction. You've got to redo it, Ron. You're an actor. <laughs> it was like, 70 <laughs> years? I, I know, never- Ron. I didn't hear that. I didn't know anything about that because we, you know, what we have here is uh, Phantom, and it's been running for like 25, 30 years, which is extraordinary. And you guys have a, 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 a singer play that has been running for 70 years. That's insane. That's great. Ron, haven't you got perfect crime? How long has that been running? <laughs> now we're talking about that's not on Broadway. But that's ah, not- right, right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There are shows that have been running off, like uh, 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 not a midsummer night's dream. There are a few shows that have been running and will be running, I think, for years to come. But to have something be on on main stage Broadway for so yeah. long, that means that people have to be coming back to see it. That can't just be all new people coming. That's got to be some real folks who say, "I love this piece. Let's go see it now." And that's a great win for a producer. I'll bring in a question that I think you could both answer here. Um, I'll start with you, Ron, on this. This is from uh, ah, the wonderful Tessa Niles, who is with us. Uh, Tessa, by the way, um, uh, is, well, basically, she is a backing singer to the stars. She has worked with everyone from... Uh, let's let's. Where do we even begin? David Bowie, The Police, Mick Jagger, uh, Duran Duran, Robbie Williams. She is the voice of the music industry. Uh, Tessa, great that you are joining us on this conversation. So, um, the production costs are they different between the US and the UK? Ron, you kind of tackled that a little bit earlier, thinking that very much it's cheaper to run something in the West End than it would be Broadway. Just pick up on that. Well, that is exactly true. And the production costs are much cheaper, which is why I want to put the UK on my list of places to run shows before they come to Broadway, because the significant difference in terms of uh, the cast, the crew, rentals, um, people who work in the theater is just substantially less. And so it makes it for a very a very nice model to to, to especially to run a test case because you don't really make money when you're doing out of town runs you don't make that until broadway and my understanding is that ticket prices uh in the west end aren't the 140 250 dollars per ticket to see a show so you you know you just aren't going to make a a ton of money if you have a limited run but on the other hand you don't have to outweigh a ton of money to get a show up and running so yeah, it's a huge difference in terms of the cost of, of productions for the two locations. Uh, from the West End point of view, John, and you, as a theatre critic, you go and see so many West End productions. And I know whenever we're presenting on the radio together, you're often updating me on, you know, where this has come from, what theatre's been uh, remodeled to pay for it, uh, or the other way around, um, you know, what, how it works. So give us a kind of sense from that West End perspective about these productions that come in. Well, yes, it's it's either stuff that that we start or the shows that come over from New York. Because the the other thing for me that highlights the difference in the costs is where the um, tapings of of live shows. The King and I that started at Lincoln Center was recorded at the London Palladium. Um, mm. uh, uh, that Kinky Boots that started on Broadway. Uh, was recorded in London. And mm-hmm. um, one of my guilty pleasures, SpongeBob SquarePants, the musical, <laughs> yes, I was actually taped 
at the, in Plymouth in the UK. They brought everything over because it was true? much cheaper. Yes, it was. But this is a show that was never that's never had a commercial run here, but its taping was done wow. in wow. Plymouth, which wow. really underlines your point about the differences in cost. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing that we're seeing now with Hamilton and we're due to get Diana and we're uh, and I think Apple are now doing a taping of come from away. Yep. I was just talking to the producer the other day. She was in the theater and they were taping it. Yep. Yep. So that's going to be another way that the work can be shared around the world. And that's Absolutely. one of the other things that what we've been through is horrible and, you know, wouldn't want to play any of that down. But I was able to watch um, online Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike from Lincoln Center that otherwise I would never have seen. Nope. That is the uh, one saving grace of this catastrophe and tragedy mm -hmm. is that it has forced storytellers to expand their audience base by, because you can't, the only thing we can do is electronic, right? So I didn't, I would not have guessed if you told me five years ago that, you know, Hamilton would be a live caption and it would be on Netflix or anything, because that is, we, I don't want to say we're paranoid. We really are concerned about um, having a show be uh, overseen, overlooked, because it's already out there in terms of this, you know, on, on screen and, and, and streaming because we, the mindset is there's only limited number of dollars. So if you pay to see the stream, then you won't come to the theater to see the show. And I can guarantee you, as I looked at the show, great production. I love, I saw Hamilton six times, it's extraordinary on every level, but it's not the same thing as seeing that in the theater. It's no. just live capture. No not the same thing as seeing oh, that show in the theater. I, I, I agree. I, I, I really loved watching uh, Hamilton uh, on the on the, the stream uh, from, from Disney. I, I really enjoyed seeing it again. Uh, but when I was with John, uh, we watched it together in London. And, uh, you know, he'd seen it before. It was a, just a great sense for me of this. I couldn't, if I'm honest with you, I could not believe what I was hearing in terms of the sound was so stunning. It just took you there, you know, grabbed hold of your heartbeat. And I spoke to the musical director of Hamilton um, and we were talking about, you know, getting that right and how do you make that happen? And it, 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 I think for all of them, it was just this incredible explosion. But yeah, I agree. I don't think it's exactly the same. It's a great thing during this period. And maybe we will also, if we can't get to a place, we'll watch it. But I don't think it is a, is a replacement. But best play for Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike in 2013. You got one of your Tonys, which is just behind you, Ron, just behind there. Um, uh, you know, amazing. Uh, I know that it's one of John's uh, favorites as well when uh, when he's obviously spoke to us earlier about how much he's enjoyed. But for you, these performances, clearly they they are something that you do and you have a love for, and then you move on to the next project. And that's where we'll go next here on the live stream. John, as always, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate your, uh, Thanks, your time John. with us. It's nice Thanks to meet you, John. And you. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> uh, John Martin there. Yeah, theatre <laughs> critic. And a theatre critic who he didn't say anything negative there. I know. I think he's great. I want to hang out with him when I come to London. I, I, I'll be honest with you. He's my theatre critic on my radio show. He's sacked because there's no way he can just be so nice. What's wrong? <laughs> uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want theatre critics to start being nice. This is what this is what the pandemic's done to us, Ron. It's turned everyone into nice people. <laughs> no, he's a lovely guy. He's he's great. He's uh, he's a very talented uh, theatre producer as well. He's done some really good stuff over here. So uh, we wish him well for uh, joining us. Thank you, Ron, for uh, answering some of those points as well. So look, you know, as we continue on our live stream here, and uh, as always, the time ticks away. As always, this is what happens. You know, we we get to the stage where uh, we, we start getting some of those questions in as well. If you want to um, put a question up, by the way, to Ron about anything to do with the theatre, particularly with a focus on Broadway, but also maybe you're some watching right now who's 
um, uh, aspiring to get into the industry, uh, it, 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 how do you get in? That's the kind of thing, you know, that you may want to ask, or you might want to look ahead to what the future of Broadway in the West End particularly might be. Please do put your message up now, and we'll try and answer a few of those questions before the end of our conversation here together. I want to move on to talking a little bit about your uh, career as an actor, because, you know, that is another part of your life. I don't know how, if I'm honest with you, I don't know how you fit it all in, but you, you, you clearly do, but you're, you're acting well. I just want to pick up on a few things recently as well, because it will be in the minds of a lot of people who are watching, but, um, you appeared on, uh, the resident, the TV series in uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. I love that show. I love that. You love that show. I didn't even know it was carried there. That's great. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, brilliant. Uh, but also, you know, working uh, with Marvel on The Defenders, The Daredevil as well. Um, and also another one of my hugely excited, I'm so excited about this, Succession. That is so fun. Can I tell you, because it was a very small part in the very first Doesn't episode. Doesn't matter, it's Succession. And I mean, I got so many people watch that. I got texts and phone calls, literally must have been at least 50 which is extraordinary. And, it, and, and because of how it's streamed, there'll be some here in this month, some then that week, then the next week, because you watch it when you watch it, I guess. But yeah, I, I, I love that show. And I was so surprised that so many people also love and watch that show. Yeah, so so when you get get any of these gigs that are part of your world, how does it work for you as an actor? And how do you, I'm my brain is saying, how do you schedule your time with all the other stuff you do? Simon says entertainment, the work you do, the the people you are coaching, the mentoring you're doing, the producing you're doing, the shows that are on the way. How do you do that? And have I just touched a raw nerve where you're going to go, I don't know, I don't know. I kind of, yeah, I kind of, that is a nerve. And uh, I don't know the answer to that. I think I just make it happen, right? Because I love all of those things. And so they are not, they are labors of love and it is, it can be exhausting. For example, I remember I was, uh, when I shot uh, The Resident, I had to go to Atlanta for 10 days to shoot because it was a, a, it was a long, long process. And I remember thinking that, okay, I've got to make sure that I do all the things that need me to be in person before as much as possible and then schedule them the moment I come back. And that's what I did. That made for a hellish week before I left and a ridiculous week for when I came back. But because I'm a producer and because I run my own show, I could do that, right? So, and I could also do phone calls and so forth within the shooting schedule that I had free time to do things. So. It's it, it, it's challenging, but it can be managed. Um, I cannot, however, do out of town plays because I right. can't be out of town for eight to twelve weeks. At least that's what I thought. But now that COVID has happened, it has told all of us that we don't have to be in the same room with anyone really to get work done. And I love the fact that I, my commute time from one meeting to the other is about four seconds, which is as long as it takes to close this window and this Zoom call and open that Zoom call. Um, I don't think I'll ever go back to a constantly moving around schedule of meeting people because you lose so much time in transit. Whereas here, I can sit with my top on, maybe not the bottom, but shh, I don't get that. And I could do meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. It's great. It saves me so much time. So I fit it in. I fit it in because I love it. And I fit it in because it's my passion. Yeah. That's and uh, that that's interesting, isn't it? And I think the changing world of how meetings where you were told, right, you know, get on this tube, go to this place, be here by a certain time, get on a plane and travel halfway around the world for a meeting that lasts 15 minutes, you know, kind of not going to happen anymore. It's, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of people's energy. It's a waste of their mental health, quite frankly. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And yet we've all been doing it for so long that we've almost forgotten how we can actually have the ability to go, no, I'm not doing that. I can't do that. You know, it's just bizarre. Um, but but the acting side as well, uh, do you have a... Does producing interest you more? Does acting interest you more? Are they a both a level thing? Oh, 
Um, now, you, a lot of people ask me that question. It's a valid question. I'm not going to undercut it by, by saying that. But it's like you're saying to me, do you love your child uh, Olivia or do you love your child Eric more? Pick yeah, one. But you, hold, on, one you hold, hold on. If you, if you, I hope they're not watching, but if you were really honest about it, there will be one that you like more. I'm, I'm, I'm joking. Okay, so let me say this. I will say this. I will say this. I will say this. Acting gives you the luxury of focusing on just the acting, whether that's the character development, finding the backstory, making sure that you dissect the script and understand, you know, where the beats live, because you can just dive in there. Producing, on the other hand, it requires, and I tell people, producing has used more of everything that I've ever learned in every place I've ever been in my life, every school, um, every, every, every job, every volunteer work. It all comes into play because producers, the buck stops with them. So you think you know what you're going to be doing that day, but then a fire could start that had you didn't even imagine that it was going to happen. Now you've got to focus your resources on that. And that thing that you're focusing on may not be your forte. You know what I mean? Like I had a first, my first film, um, the director and one of the lead actors had a tiff and he stormed off stage. Just, I mean, offset, just, just walked away. And she's Anthony, 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 Anthony. So he was done. Right. So then my job was to have to go to him to tell the director, let me let me spend a few minutes with him, then to talk to the actor, find out what his problem or issue or concern or what have you was. Talk through that, help him understand how we can figure out a way to not make that happen again and to eventually get him back on set. Right. That might be something difficult for someone who has never had to have interpersonal group dynamic skills. Right. Because you may not that might not be your forte. Yeah. And I know that for me, it was part of my forte because people always refer to me as the ambassador. You know, I can calm folks down when they are about to go on the warpath. Right. So it was lucky that I had that skill. But, you know, if you write a book or read a book about producing, there is no book that captures all of what a producer can do because every show is different. Every play is different. And you're going to run into new things that is not written down that you're going to have to just figure it out. So that is a little bit more stressful in that you don't know what's coming, but it's also a little more exciting. So that's exciting. This is exciting, but in very, very different ways. Does that make sense? So, yeah, it does. Absolutely. And, and and because it's different, that's probably what keeps you wanting to do both because you've that's got right. projects going on. You're a, you're a project person. That's how you tick. And I get that completely from the conversation we've had here and in past on the radio. Um, so what about Simon Says Entertainment? Because building that up over the years, that must be quite a lot of effort to kind of you know decide first of all what do you do how do you, what are the what are the best bits of you that you want to be able to to work with other people on and i know with coaching and mentoring and the rest uh, but also creating projects and making those projects come to fruition that building up simon says must have been really interesting to do it, it has been and it has been but i will tell you that it has always been an evolution when i started simon says entertainment First of all, I wasn't even sure that I needed to have a Simon Says Entertainment, like an LLC, because I can just produce as Ron, right? And then when I started getting into it, I thought, well, two things. From a taxation, uh, tax paying point of view, it would be good to have an entity that's over here that's not me and separate from me um, for liability purposes. But then as I continued to work, I started, I started refining what it is that I want to do in the world. Right. And what kind of projects that I want to do in the world. Back then, I was saying I want to tell good stories. I, I, ideally, it should be about diverse voices. That was pretty much it. Right. Now I can talk about what diverse voices means. It means that it can be about seniors like the documentary Viva Verde that I'm producing. That's that just got a chunk of money from a from a production company, which we we're happy about. Or it could be about people of color, LGBTQ. It could be now I'm even thinking about the environment. Right. Those are the kinds of things that I wasn't thinking about in terms of that umbrella of diversity. Mm -hmm. When I started the company, I had to figure out that there were three things that I look for in every production um, or every project. One, that it is about underrepresented communities, that it has high artistic integrity, meaning the people who are putting the show together and that it has commercial viability. Because early on, I was putting money in my shows and I was losing money. 
they were critically acclaimed. People love the movies. You know, they have Sundance and this and that, but they didn't make money. And so I had to really refocus on that to say, I, this is not sustainable. I need to make sure that new projects coming down the pipe have a very strong commercial viability uh, component to them to be able to do it because I have to sustain the company. And to sustain the company, you've got to find those projects that are going to bring in money and hopefully be, our, our, I mean, amazingly brilliant in terms of creativity. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So it's just kind of things that I just evolve over time. Even just like coming up with the, with the logo, right? I recently updated the logo about a year and a half ago because I felt that I loved the logo of me walking on set, you know, and or rather working on, on the screen, you know, and sit down, you only saw my profile. But then I was like, mm, this doesn't really look like the level of production company that I am today. So then, you know, we did some more research and said, okay, here's a new logo that fits where and who we are right now. Yeah, and, and that, I guess, it takes ages to kind of really hone it down to what you want it to be, and then it develops and then goes forward. And clearly, that's what you're doing now with all of the projects you're doing. It's been really interesting sort of charting through with you about where we are, what we're doing, the kind of stuff that's going to Broadway. Right now, though, as we literally are on the cusp of these productions coming back in and uh, theatre, both in the UK and the US, starting to emerge again and still socially distanced performances for people being in environments where they've got to do lots of checks and all the rest. But does this feel for you, as you sit there, a uh, stone's throw away from Broadway itself, does it feel like everything will open up and things will happen. And I know in the US, there's been lots going on in terms of uh, uh, dealing with COVID and, and how that's gone. So uh, what, where do you think we are? Where, where are you right now? Well, <clears throat> everything is reopening. I think it's five o'clock tonight, you know, restaurants and bars and health clubs, you know, will, won't have restrictions. So there has been enough in the government's mind that we are approaching herd immunity. So for me, that's great because I have, I missed doing the things that I came to New York to do. And I think that's true of just about every New Yorker. So I am feeling quite hopeful right now, to be really honest with you. I'm feeling that there are such great signs. I, I'm coming home from my acupuncturist to come for this meeting here today, I was sitting in ungodly traffic. And I'd forgotten that New York <laughs> had traffic. And I was like, where the hell are these people going? Where are they going? What time is this? What's Because I, I, I had not been in any traffic for over a year, right? But then I was like, oh, this is good. This means that people who are now making their way to New Jersey came into the city earlier today and now did their thing and now they're going home. That is a sign of a booming economy. So people are actually stepping out, they're going to work, they're doing things. And it may not be exactly the way it was when the city shut down. There may be a new way of doing certain things, but I feel that everyone is bubbly, like literally kind of bubbly to get to do the stuff that they're doing, if that makes sense. Finally, Ron, why do you love what you do? And, and what is it about the art of being able to tell a story, get some actors to stand on a stage and to be able to bring in an audience from outside where they've just got out of the cab, they've just maybe got off a plane, maybe they've traveled from a hotel and, and then they arrive in this other world? Hmm. That's a good question, actually. Um, for me, I love storytelling, right? And storytelling, as I tell people all the time, is, the, is and I said, I think earlier today, the greatest agent of change on the planet. But more importantly, it makes people happy. It gives people a chance to step out of their lives, out of the doldrums or whatever they're dealing with in their life and to step into another place. It, I, I talk about Thoughts of a Colored Man uh, being the case that we invite you into our living room and you sit down and you can be part of the dynamics of who these people are, why are these people the way they are, and you can let your, your, your pains, your frustrations, you can leave that all at the door because we're gonna take you on a journey. And for that 90 minutes or in, for my longer plays, an hour and a half, you get to set your personal life aside and you get to, like a kid in a candy store, you can be in this place where you don't know what you're gonna see or how it's going to happen or what's going to happen. So you, you're open to an experience. 
And I love giving people an experience. I think that is the greatest thing that I can do is my calling. And yes, I do want to ch change the world one play at a time, which is an <laughs> added thing. But storytelling just makes me, and from an acting point of view, this is one of the things I love about acting, is it makes you be in the moment. And to your point from earlier, <clears throat> you know, what are you doing right now? Being an actor means that you have to be in that moment at that time. You can't be thinking about what you cooked last night. You can't think about what you're going to go to buy so you can make dinner tomorrow. You are literally in this moment with this person and you are connecting. And that connection is such a fundamental thing that humanity is all about, connecting on a real level. And even though it's a story, and even though it isn't my personal story, it makes me focus on being in the moment. And it's those in those moments, I have never felt more alive in my life. They make me sit, be in this moment. And that's what life is about. Life is not about living in the past or the future, to which you, your point. It is about being here right now, experiencing this moment. And for me, that has been a lesson that acting of lesson, that lesson, uh, acting lesson has taught me how to do the same when I'm on a on a car ride and I'm really looking at the mountains, or if I'm at the ocean, or if I'm with some friends, is to say, "Be right here, right now," and you will feel the joy of living. I've absolutely adored being in the moment with you in this conversation, uh, Ron. Thank you so much uh, for for spending some time with us from there. Uh, it's been a real pleasure and uh, thank you to all those who've been watching as well and i know that people have just been intently on the screen comments just coming about just enjoying the conversation so i like oh. that i like the fact people have felt comfortable to just watch so thank you uh thank you. thank you for your time thanks for being with us and we look forward to seeing those shows come back into broadway and uh and, and the re-emergence of ain't too proud and uh the, the way you've talked about thoughts of a colored man tonight as well um i, I i'm hoping we're going to get to see that over here in the uk at some point um that would be an amazing thing if you could make that happen and work with uh, the uk that's one of the things I'm going to be doing and we're going to be working on with my partners. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Don. It's so good to talk to you as always. There we are. What a conversation tonight here on the live stream. Thank you so much for watching as you do. Uh, we've done, this is the ninth episode uh, with Ron and we've had some amazing people from all different walks of the entertainment industry. It's been really interesting to hear. Remember, if you want to look at all these videos that we've done, you can subscribe. You can go and have a look on YouTube at Laughing Frog Productions and you'll see all the videos, including this one, which was live there uh, as it is now, uh, but also uploaded with all the rest. A little library we're really creating. And and I love that. You know, yeah, I'm going to tell you again, subscribe. Um, but, you know, it, it is something that uh, has been really fun for me to do as well, uh, to just talk to, to all those people and, and to get your reaction. I love the fact as well, if you're watching this tomorrow or next week or next year, and you're getting stuff from what you just heard there with Ron, amazing. And what, what a, just a brilliant, at the end there, a sense of why we're all here. It's not the past. It's not even the future. It's right now. And that's what I think we're all trying to live one day, one step at a time. I just want to end this evening with just a moment to reflect uh, on someone from the entertainment industry we've just lost, a man who started his career uh, working with people like uh, Alfred Hitchcock and, and then continued throughout his career with Martin Scorsese towards the end of his life. He's just left us, but just a moment of reflection for him. But for me, to you, and from Ron Simons, my guest tonight from Broadway, thanks so much for watching. Good night.